Good morning. My name is Donna Cabina. As a member of the Crose Committee this year, it is my honor to introduce our next guest speaker, Dr. Kim Potowski. Dr. Kim Potowski is a professor of Spanish linguistics at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Her research focuses on Spanish in the United States with a focus on who uses it, with whom, and for what purposes, what changes it is undergoing, and how does it connect to identity and to promoting social justice. She began directing her campus's Spanish Heritage Language Program in 2002 and is the founding director of its summer study program, uh, I'm sorry, summer ab study abroad program in Mexico, where she spent a year as a Fulbright scholar. Her advocacy for the value of education in two languages for all U.S. children was the focus of her 2013 TED Talk, No Child Left Monolingual. In addition, she has authored and edited over 12 books. Please help me in giving Dr. Kim Potowski a warm welcome. Thanks. Good morning. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'd like to start by thanking everybody who made this uh, Crow's Symposium possible, including uh, Beth Woods, Riza Abbasian, um, Ariadne de Villa. We've got Danielle Grove, Donna Kubena, Jonathan Zeitelman, and Ashley Ford. Thank you so much for making this possible. I'm really glad to be here. And I'm not just saying that because it's snowing a lot in Chicago. Um, this is our street, that is our vehicle <laughs> underneath the snow. Uh, uh, some of you may not know in Chicago there's this system called divs. It's kind of hotly contested. Yeah, you've heard of it. It's when you dig your car out on the street, you put something there to keep your spot. And help you God if you take somebody's spot that they have put something, you know, for divs on it. And there's really interesting things that you'll find. You'll find websites where they'll document the things that people will put <laughs> to keep their spot during dibs. Um, just about anything you can find, and I thought y'all might really like this one here. Um, you'll be in big trouble if you take this spot. Um, also, I was really happy I got some nice bling um, over at the hotel. I, I just wanted to thank my, my hosts for, for being so thoughtful. Not only was this the, I thought this was the best thing I'd ever gotten in a bling bag, these are, uh, I guess, Texas blue bonnets that y'all that are local from here. How thoughtful and wonderful is that? I'm totally going to go back. I can't plant them in the winter, obviously, but I will plant them and see what happens. And then this was there too, a book of Texas speak, which, as a linguist, now that's tied with the with the flowers. I got to say, and it really just made me miss Molly Ivins because I I read the whole thing cover to cover last night and. And so many of those phrases I had first come across um, reading uh, Molly Ivins. Well, anyway, I'm going to back up now, and I'm going to talk about um, uh, the value of, of multilingualism. And hopefully I've got something to say that Tim didn't say last night and that Naya didn't say this morning. Hopefully i got something new to say. Um, we're going to take a really broad step back, and I want you to uh, just think about how many people more or less are there on the planet? What's the world population right now? Back of the envelope. What do you think? Eight billion? We're almost there. This is where we were at when I was having coffee this morning. Um, <laughs> there's a population counter. You can go online and it goes like this and you can see births and deaths and all that. So that's, let's call it eight billion, okay? That's how many people there are on the planet. If you had to guess, what percent of them do you think are bilingual or multilingual? What percent of those eight billion humans? Any guesses? 70? 20? 30? Over 80? That's, I usually get a range like that. Um, the answer is we don't know. <laughs> we don't know, but um, Professor Francois Grosjean, who's uh, uh, done quite a bit of research on this, insists that it's between 50 and 70. Okay, so we're going to be conservative here today, and we're going to say 60. So each time I say, now, what percent of the planet did I say was bilingual? You're going to go 60. So let's remember that number, okay? Um, now, what about the United States? What percent of the U.S. population do you think is bilingual or multilingual. So raise your hands if you think it's between 0 and 25. 0 and 25% of the U.S. monolingual. I only see a couple hands. Okay, hands down. Raise your hand if you think it's 26 to 50. Ooh, I see a lot of hands now. 26 to 50%. Okay, hands down, please. How many of y'all think, oh, come on, we got to be like the rest of the world. We got to be somewhere between 51 to 75%. I don't see any hands, so I'm guessing no one's delusional enough to think that we are 76 to 100%. No, yeah, okay. The answer again, my friends, is we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. The American Community Survey asks these two questions. Does the person speak a language other than English at home? 
at home. So that doesn't quite get at our nation's bilingualism, does it? Because you might speak Korean, but you don't speak it at home, right? Uh, and then the next question is, how well does the person speak English? Now, you might say, not at all. Well, that doesn't mean that you're not bilingual, because maybe you speak Korean and Gujarati, right? So we don't have a good way to measure our nation's bilingualism. This is the best we got, okay? And the last time we did this, drum roll please, it was 21.6. So no cheating. Who were the people who raised their hands at the beginning? Okay, so you were right. But we're not going to applaud and be happy because at least I think this is kind of sad. I think this is a really low number. Um, and just to put this in a little bit of perspective, we've got 60% of the world with our conservative figure riding around on a bicycle. If we think about languages as wheels, right? They got at least two and they're riding around on a bicycle. 40% trying to get around on a unicycle monolingually. But then us, we got 80% of us monolingual in English, okay? And, and guess what? A lot of that 80%, they like it that way. They don't want other languages coming around and polluting, right? So, and we'll come back to that in a minute. But what I want to do is talk, I think maybe what I bring that's different from what Tim and Naya brought today is I'm going to think about things from a social justice perspective and from an educational perspective as well. And I want to do that through the experiences of two children. These kids are now 17 years old. They were in my older son's uh, school, right? Um, so you've got kids who, um, uh, when they show up to school, their English is not uh, considered to be strong enough to participate in the mainstream program. They're called English learners. Um, they're also called heritage speakers of whatever that home language was. So Joaquin happens to be a heritage speaker of Spanish. Where are my Spanish speakers in the audience? I'm going to have a couple of examples in Spanish here and there, so you might have to help your neighbor. Um, and then I'm going to um, also talk about kids like uh, Julian, um, who is my English monolingual, and, and I'm going to uh, present what happens in this country through these two kids. So a kid like Joaquin shows up to school. Uh, the school measures his English in all 50 states, right? It's a requirement. And if it is determined that his English isn't strong enough to, to, to participate in the mainstream curriculum, they've got to do something with uh, with him to help him and I'll come back to what those options are in a moment I will sum up what this country tends to do in this way we erase either directly or indirectly those languages that Gujarati that Korean that Spanish the, whatever these children show up with we end up erasing it okay or through benign neglect we don't water that plant and it just kind of dies okay um, because as like I mentioned before the 80 percent of this country that's monolingual in English a lot of them like it that way. And you don't have to go very far to find cases of linguistic bullying. I have a website, which I, it's not at all pleasant for me to maintain. Um, whenever I see something that, and I don't think it's happening more now. I think we're just recording it more now because we have our cell phones, okay? Um, we have things that range from macroaggressions. Raise your hand. You ever been out in public speaking a language other than English and you got that stink eye from somebody? Anybody? Or somebody, uh -huh, somebody said something to you? It happens uh, uh, a little less frequently to people who present as white. Happens a lot more frequently to people who present as ethno-racial minorities. Um, but then it can also, uh, unfortunately, turn into a more macro aggression, right? People being assaulted, people being kicked off planes, people being suspended for speaking Native American languages in schools, right? And you might think, oh, these are just isolated cases here and there. No. Now, somewhere right now in the United States, probably multiple places, somebody is being bullied in some fashion for speaking a language other than English in public. You might remember this fellow, this lawyer, who went um, to the cafeteria and went on a tirade against the two ladies who were speaking Spanish, who, P.S., were probably hired because they spoke Spanish. And then we see some cases where then folks are fired for speaking Spanish in the break room, right? Um, uh, if you heard about this, you can see there's a lot of really nasty rhetoric involved with, with, with languages. And then check this out. These two gals were on the border, and if you look closely, you'll notice that is not the border with Mexico, is it? <laughs> you see that snow there, right? This was the border with Canada. These were two ladies up in Montana who um, were uh, detained. I think it was about two hours they were detained. And when they asked the, the official here, you know, why are you detaining us? He said, because you're speaking Spanish. That is somehow suspect, right? It indexes uh, questions of documentation and, and, and things like that. Now, you probably know the United States does not have an official language. You knew that, right? There is nothing in the Constitution or anywhere else that says English is our official language. P.S. I don't think we need one. 
I don't think English needs protection. I don't think we need to declare the sun our uh, source of light and heat either, okay? Um, I, I just don't think it needs it. However, if you look at our 50 states, 31 of them do have some kind of official English legislation, okay? Now, I'm not saying immigrants don't need to or want to learn English. You know, I'm the first one in line. I, I don't know anybody who thinks they don't need to learn English, but what's the best way to get them, to help them to learn English? I don't think it's through legislation. You pass a law and it, it helps absolutely no one. No one's sitting around going, yeah, I don't need to learn English. Oh, wait, now it's a law, now I need to. That's, that's absolutely not the case, and, and we know this is true. Um, these states do have some official English legislation. Um, I was uh, pleasantly surprised to see that Texas does not have that, okay? Illinois, we do have it since 1968, but nobody knows about it because it really doesn't affect us in our day-to-day. -day. But it can affect people in their day-to-day -day in different states, okay? When it's, it, it's just sort of this, it kind of gives this message that if you're speaking something other than English, you're somehow suspect or you're running afoul of the law. Um, and let me just take one moment to point out what I think are the, the four cool states, right? The ones that you can see here in turquoise because they've got English plus something else, okay? So in Louisiana, there are two official state languages. Does anybody know what it'll be in addition to English? French, that's right. In New Mexico, this one's hard. What's it going to be? English and Spanish, that's right. Um, in Hawaii, it's English and Hawaiian. And in Alaska, it's English plus a variety of, of native languages um, from, from the first peoples who were up in Alaska. Um, so what tends to happen, and it doesn't just happen in the United States, but it happens very quickly in the United States, is this intergenerational language shift. Okay, so we've got a lady, in this case from Mexico, who immigrates, um, and she's monolingual in Spanish, right? Okay, uh, let's say she comes here when she's 25. Uh, will she learn English and become bilingual? Perhaps, she probably wants to, but if she works three jobs, it might not be easy for her to get to her ESL class. She might not have transportation to get there. She might have no one to watch her kids while she's going there. It might cost too much money, so, the folks who are, you know, concerned about immigrants needing to learn English, yes, they do. Let's help them, okay? And that's perhaps a separate talk where we can talk about paying people enough that they only have to work eight hours a day and then they can study English and the other ways in which we can have free English classes, etc. But anyway, so this gal comes here and she's monolingual in Spanish. Okay. Her daughter, this lady here in the middle, born and raised here in Austin, Texas. Okay. Will she know English? Yeah, she will, because she's going to go to school like every other kid, and she's, her English is going to sound like most other kids. Will she know Spanish? Well, if she's the firstborn kid, probably, because that's all that her parents speak in the home, okay? If she went back to Mexico over the summers a couple of times when she was young, then that'll boost up her Spanish, okay? Um, if she's got uh, somebody in the house, other folks in the house speaking to her in Spanish, and if she goes to a school where Spanish is used, all these things will contribute, but, but it's very likely that this gal will be bilingual, okay? Now, her daughter is born and raised here in Austin, Texas. So she's the granddaughter of that first lady. Will she know English? Yes, of course, born and raised in Austin. Her English is going to be like every other Austin kid. Will she know Spanish? That's my question. Will she know Spanish? It's very, very common that she does not. She might have some uh, receptive proficiency, and we don't use the word passive in linguistics. There's nothing passive about processing language and deriving meaning from it, but she may not be able to produce much Spanish, okay? Um, and this is super typical with, with all of our languages that come. In fact, I can't remember who it was who said that the U.S. is a linguistics graveyard, a language graveyard. Languages come here to die, okay? Now, again, I think it's important for everyone to learn English, and we need to help people to do it, but why do they have to lose their original languages. Is that the price of admission to this country, that you have to leave your language at the door? Can't we encourage people to maintain their home languages as they're, incur as they're learning English? And in fact, to those people who, s who, who, who seem to prioritize the learning of English, I'm about to show you some data right now that suggests you really want them to learn English? Tell you what, educate them in their home language. Educate them in their home language, and let me show you what's going to happen to their English acquisition, okay? On average, we have tons of data that shows this. Anyway, another reason why I think this is particularly sad is that, you know, it breaks the relationship between, between that granddaughter and her grandmother. I mean, I don't know how many of y'all have a close relationship with your grandparents. You remember them fondly, or you still, you know, um, have a fond relationship with them. Can you imagine not being able to talk to them at all, right? And I just don't think we need to subject our families to this kind of rupture, okay? So 
part of it has to do with this, uh, what we'll call linguistic climate, right? 80% of this country is monolingual in English. A whole bunch of them like it that way. And that goes back to the founding of the nation state, right? In the uh, 19th century, where we said one nation, one language, right? And particularly in the United States, where we have so many folks who are immigrants, right? Um, it's important to mention we're not just an immigrant nation. We also have our Native American populations and our people who were brought over enslaved, right? Everybody, boom, English. That was sort of considered the glue that held us together. But instead of this melting pot, couldn't we be more like a mosaic where English is the, right, the mortar, and then everybody can have their little piece of what they are, right? Now, some of what the problem derives from is, and you, you might have heard this before in your life, you'll get these well-intentioned professionals, okay? I don't doubt that a lot of them are very well-intended. And they will tell you, oh, you better not speak, fill in the blank, Spanish, Greek, Polish, to your children. Don't do it, okay? And it's one thing when, you're, when your comadre tells you that or your neighbor or your hairdresser tells you that, okay? They might not know better, but actual professionals, doctors, I've heard pediatricians tell this, two people, okay? Now, I'm sorry, you're not a linguist. I mean, I don't give you gastrointestinal advice, <laughs> okay? Nor do I give you advice about your car engine, okay? You need to stay in your lane, okay? Don't talk about, don't tell people what they should or should not do with languages if you're not a linguist, okay? Now, why might people give this advice to parents? Well, they might be concerned that the child's not going to learn English, or that they will have an accent when they grew up. Now, we have plenty of research, and I pointed to some of it, right, that suggests that this absolutely isn't the case. In fact, there's one study um, that I'll just bring up that I don't think you mentioned, um, and it's from Boston, and they had a, a couple hundred families, I think. Half of those families, they had convinced the mothers to switch to English in the household. They were all Spanish-speaking. The other half of the mother said, Nel, en esta casa hablamos español, <laughs> right? They measured the children's English and Spanish vocabulary. I believe it was an 18-month 18 18 period. And guess what they found out? The children whose mothers had switched to English did not show higher English vocabulary, okay? The difference between those two groups of kids was the Spanish. The children whose mothers had switched to, Spani to English had much lower Spanish, Okay? So you see what's happening here? They thought they were improving their kids' English, and they didn't, and they threw their kids' Spanish under the bus. All right? So what I'm trying to say here is it's, it's not a bad thing. If you want to speak English at home with your children, go right ahead. But don't let anybody tell you that you're somehow harming your children or, or that you're, that you're going to delay their, their, their linguistic development in any fashion. Okay? I think the other reason why people give this, again, terrible advice to not speak languages at home, and Naya, you did mention this, they're afraid the kid will become confused. Okay? Now, beginning of this presentation, what number did we say? What percent of this planet did we say is bilingual? Do you think 60% of the planet is confused? Do you think that it's just mass confusion running around? Or do you think that when the majority of a population does something, that's what is supposed to happen in, in a sense? that the, the word norm, right? Normal comes from norm. It's what the majority of human brains do. What that suggests to me is that the human brain is meant to be bilingual, okay? But yet we have this monolingual bias, right? Where bilingualism is somehow seen as whatever. There's no books that say monolingualism and its contents, right? All, you know, nobody would read that. Okay? I think people mistake for confusion a very common practice, which is mixing the languages, okay? And it was mentioned earlier, there's a fancy linguistic word for this, code switching. We know that code switching follows linguistic rules. It is not mishmash, it is not random. But I get that normal parents, non-linguist parents, normal parents, they, they might not understand this. They might think, oh my goodness, I'm ruining my child. Nobody plays with their children's futures. Nobody does, but this message is not getting out there, that this is a very normal practice that actually requires strong levels of syntax to do intrasentential code switching. If you're, one of your languages is weak, you're not going to do it, okay? Furthermore, it marks a bilingual identity, okay? There's no reason why you should have to try to repress one or the other, and my students, they'll come to me sort of with their tail between their legs, and they'll say, Maestra, I speak Spanglish. And I'll say, you should be proud of that. You should be absolutely proud of that. Right? I mean, yes, we can work on ways to develop your formal academic Spanish. That's why you're here in this classroom, but don't be ashamed of it. The Arabic speakers will say they speak Arabish, and the Chinese kids will say they speak Chinglish, 
que suena grosería, pero no es grosería, okay? Um, and my own kids, I have examples from them. Here we are getting our uh, vaccines. But when they were little, you can see that they code switched all the time. And much like Naya, I was a total nerd writing down stuff they would say, right? Um, yo soy big boy. I don't want paint any más. Yo quiero ver who that niña is, right? Um, you, you know how in sp you spend a lot of time telling a kid, no grites, no grites, don't shout, no grites, no grites. Pues en una ocasión su papá me gritó algo de un lado de la casa para otra y el niño voltea y le dice, Papi, don't greet. Don't greet. He was trying to tell him, no grites, don't yell, right? <laughs> Because he had shouted something across the home. Um, so when I saw these things, I was like, oh my, and I ran and wrote them down and here I am 13 years later sharing them with you, right? But I understand that a normal parent might look at this and go, oh, oh my God, my comadre was right. I'm going to ruin my kids. How are they going to walk around talking like this? Okay, here's the thing. They don't run around talking like this their whole lives. Code switching is also developmental. They don't do these kinds of code switches anymore. Now they do the kinds of code switches that adult bilingual Spanish English speakers do. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with those kinds of code switches. Okay, a bilingual is not two monolinguals rolled into one. They do not have to pass for monolinguals either. Okay, we need to start respecting 60% of the planet does this. And we need to stop measuring ourselves with a monolingual ruler when most of us are bilingual. It's very important to remember this. Okay, in the same way that a, a bicycle is not two unicycles with some duct tape in the middle. Okay, it's not the same thing. Another thing that I think it's important to bring up to parents, I think some parents think it's, it's, it's as if we had two balloons in our heads and if our Spanish balloon got too big then our English balloon won't be able to grow and that's not how it works either okay and you know Naya presented some of the science to us about about how that is we've got a common underlying proficiency where the language it's like the roots underground helping each other out okay um, and you know when we think about languages if we go back to this analogy if you had to pick one of these to go from point A to point B which would you pick <laughs> right Which one's more stable? Which one's faster, right? And you don't have to look very far to find evidence, and it's even coming up in popular media and social networks all the time, you know, what speaking two languages does to the brain, that there are cognitive benefits, social benefits, bilinguals dress better, we're sexier, we're more fun at parties. Um, more seriously, the age, average age of onset of Alzheimer's, as Naya mentioned, um, average four years later, sometimes as much as 10 years later. We don't really know why yet, okay? And yet, we get a kid who shows up with this beautiful proficiency in Arabic, in Chinese, in Spanish, and we rip it out. In this country, we rip it out, or we just neglect it and let it die, okay? And I think there's just so much more we can do. But of course, if that's a, a little white and privileged child, Right? Princess Charlotte already speaks two languages. That's great. I love that she speaks two languages. I think everybody should. Okay? But I also appreciate what this person replied. So do most children of immigrants, but I guess it's less impressive when they're poor. Okay? So there's a class issue here, and there's an ethno-racial issue going on here, too. Now, let us move over to my little uh, guerito, my little Julian, okay? Uh, when does foreign, and that word foreign, of course, is very, uh, it's not the best word. We can say modern languages, world languages, etc. Um, when do you start studying a new language? Typically, typically, in the United States. How old are you? What, what grade are you in? Ninth grade, high school. That's right. How old are you when you're in ninth grade in high school? 14, 15? Is that a good time, you think? <laughs> Is that a really good time to start acquiring a new language, okay? Um, we know that learning a language before 8, 9, 10-ish, there's no magic cutoff date, okay? Um, uh, Arturo Hernandez, who's a linguist nearby here over in Houston, or at least he was, um, when he came to give us a talk in Chicago, he talked about organic memory. It is stored in a different part of the brain. Okay? And while it's true that it's, it's much too broad to say children absorb language like sponges, and I pointed that out beautifully, it has to be a certain kind of input, a certain quantity of input, you know, the quality and quantity has to be a certain way. But we do know that the younger that that begins, the better off it tends to be in the long term, the convergence onto the norm. Okay? It's like planting a seed when the soil is most fertile. Okay? But we don't do that here, do we? So I get this sentence here. I'm going to show you the first part of the sentence. Let's see if you know how the sentence ends. You ready? I studied three years of Spanish in high school, and I don't remember anything. 
I can't say. If I had a nickel for every time I've heard this, I could retire yesterday, okay? Why? Because what we do is we are trying to plant seeds in the desert, <laughs> okay? It's just too late. It's too late. Now, can some people, of course, some people can and do become beautifully bilingual later on, okay? And if this is true for you, I'm not wagging my finger at you or making fun of you. It's not your fault. And it's not your Spanish teacher's fault either. It is the system's fault, okay? We've got a system that starts too late, and we've got a system that unfortunately still does this drill and kill, right? Yo voy, tu vas, ella. It's not how languages should be taught. It's not how languages are learned, okay? Um, back in the day, we used to have um, quite a robust language. Oh, well, 31%, okay, fine, that's not robust. But 31, one out of three kids were getting some type of exposure to foreign languages, okay? Um, now, we can certainly ask ourselves about the quality of that exposure, or were they doing colors and numbers and days of the week over and over, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, etc. okay? But at least it was something, okay? Then came No Child Left Behind, and do you think the proportion of kids getting language instruction increased or decreased? It definitely went down, and the most recent data I could find doesn't even disaggregate between um, the different grade levels, but uh, the average came out to 19%. Nine, and Tim showed us last night the percent of folks in other parts of the world who are studying. In some countries, it's like 104% of people are learning languages in schools when they're young, okay? You might hear this argument. I don't need to learn another language. Most of the world speaks English. And I wanted to get to the bottom of that. What percent of the world does not speak English? And the answer is, we don't know. <laughs> I did look around. I'm, I'm pretty good at my Google Kung Fu, okay? Um, I came up with, does anybody have a guess? I was surprised. Wow, yeah. It's about 75. I, I saw one source that said 25 do and one source that said 20 do. So the next time you're at a barbecue and you hear somebody say, I don't need to learn English, da, 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 you know, you can, you can trot out this fact for them. So my thought was, instead of no child left behind, okay, what if as a motto we said, no child will be left monolingual. No child will graduate from high school monolingual. Like, I think that's a fantastic goal, and that was what I, I titled this TEDx talk that I gave back in 2013. I just looked this morning, I saw that it had 102,000 views, and yeah, no, I'm not going to lie, I was, I was kind of proud because of those, only about 100,000 were my mother <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and the students who I required to watch it, so there's totally some people watching this. Um, so I have just outlined two problems for you, okay? One problem is that with our heritage speakers, we neglect or we actively erase their languages. Then they turn 14 and we're like, orale, ahora si puedes estudiar tu lengua. It's like, what, what happened to all those years in between when they could have been developing literacy and academic skills in their heritage language? And then with our English, native English speakers, right, um, we start too late, okay, we start at 14. And our classes are the yo voy, tu vas, ella va type, okay? There's not a lot of things in this life that have a magic bullet solution, um, but this kind of does. And it's dos pájaros de un tiro, and it's called dual language education. So to tell you what dual language education is, I need to tell you a little bit about what our um, educational system looks like regarding languages. So a kid like Joaquin, remember we talked about Joaquin, he shows up four or five years old, the school assesses his English and says, ooh, Joaquin, um, we've got to give you some kind of support. It's required, by the way. Since 1975, there was a Supreme Court case that came out of California um, where the parents sued the district. These were Chinese-speaking parents. They said, my kid can't understand the instruction that's going on. They are not getting access, equal access, to public education. And the Supreme Court said, you're right and decreed that public schools that get public funding from the government must do something to help children who don't have strong enough English yet. They didn't say what that something has to be. They just said they have to do something. So let me show you what the three somethings are that we tend to do. The first option is um, only English is used in the program, but they have a, a, um, a type of a pullout service, which is called ESL, which stands for English as a Second Language, okay? Um, and that's quite common, particularly if there are fewer than 20 children who speak the same language. There are a number of states where once you hit 20 kids who speak Gujarati, for example, guess what? You have to go to door number two and find yourself a Gujarati teacher who will come in and teach 25% of the day in Gujarati. 
okay? I'm using Spanish here because that's the language I work with, and this kind of program is called bilingual education. You can see I put quotes around the word bilingual. The reason I did that is because it only goes grades kindergarten through third grade. What happens after third grade when those children are exited from these programs? What happens to their Spanish or their Gujarati or their Korean? Nobody knows, nobody cares. So the goal of these programs is not bilingualism. The goal is acquisition of English, getting out of the bilingual program as quickly as possible. That to me is not a, bi a truly bilingual program. Okay? It's more like you just use that language as a crutch for a little while, okay? Um, door number three, of course, is the best. It's dual immersion. Some people call it two-way immersion. It's got a number of different names. Check this out. Between 50 to 90% of the day is taught, in this case in Spanish, but you can substitute whatever language it is you're looking at, okay? Uh, my kids attended one that was 80% Spanish in the younger grades. And look at how it goes all the way up through eighth grade. Sometimes it even goes into the high schools, okay? This is a truly bilingual program. And not only is it for kids, oh, yet yeah, look at that. So it's watering that plant so that it can grow. Not only is it for kids like Joaquin who need to learn English, it's for kids like Julian, whose parents said, you know what? We're going to cure our family's monolingualism. <laughs> and the best way we're, they opt for this. They are choosing to not be able to understand 50 to 80% of the homework that Julian brings home, right? They don't want to wait till Julian turns 14 and then stick him in yo voy, tu vas, ella vas Spanish classes. They really want this child to become bilingual, okay? So parents opt for this program. Now, let's think back for a moment about Joaquin and his parents. I live in Chicago. Most of our local Spanish speakers are from Mexico, which I assume is true down here too. Sometimes a school district has seen the data that I'm about to show you, and they go, holy cow, we need dual immersion in this district. And it's not the white English-speaking families who object, or any kind of English-speaking, they can be, you know, African-American, they can be Chinese, Polish, whatever they are. It's not those English-speaking families that are typically very opposed. It's the Latino families. It's the Spanish-speaking families. So the district will invite me in to speak to them, or sometimes they don't invite me, I show up anyway, and I'll say, okay, ¿cuál de estos I'm talking to the parents, ¿cuál de estos tres programas creen ustedes resulta en el nivel más fuerte de inglés para sus hijos? Because we all know que el inglés es muy importante. These parents themselves have suffered for their lack of English. The last thing they want is for their children to suffer for a lack of English. So when I ask them that question, they say, no, pues door number one, all English. That's what I think is best. For Entre más inglés le hablan al niño, más inglés va a aprender el niño, eso es obvio. And I say, that's very logical what you just said. The more English they speak to the kid, the more English the kid will learn. But is it true? Is it true? Um, so I actually show them some data from up the road, from, from Houston, okay? I'm about to show you some English reading scores, and I want you to look at two. There's going to be three bars. I want you to look at two of them. The blue one is that transitional bilingual, the one that I said is not really bilingual. It's that crutch one, okay, 25% of the day. And I want you to look at the yellow bar, which is the two-way immersion, 50 to 90% of the day in Spanish, okay? The red bar, don't look at it. Pretend it's not even there. I didn't talk about that one. You ready? Here are Houston kids in 2000 who, in their English reading, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, which bar is higher, yellow or blue? Kids who are reading and doing school 50 to 90% of the day in Spanish are reading better in English. Does that make sense? No. <laughs> to some people, no. It seems a little counterintuitive. What do you mean? How about English? That was reading. How about writing? Which bar is higher, yellow or blue? Yellow. How about math? Kids who are doing math in Spanish are ending up testing better on math in English. So I say to them, you want your kids to learn English? Me too. Put them in Spanish. <laughs> and I know that doesn't make a lot of sense to some parents, okay? Because they figure, that, I don't know, if I want to get better at tennis, I don't play golf, I play tennis, okay? But sometimes the, the, the answer that's simple is, is not correct. And the correct answer is just a little more complex, right? Good science often doesn't fit on a bumper sticker or into a nice, neat little sound bite, okay? Um, sometimes people don't want to believe that. I say, okay, fine, let me show you some more data. This is California. They followed three groups of kids who, when they were little, did English only, bilingual education, or two-way immersion. And now they're grown up, they're in 11th grade, and they've got to take their state English tests, okay? Here's their English reading test. Here's how my English-only kids came out. 
Here's how my bilingual quote kids came out. Bilingual education, transitional. Uh, where do you think that yellow bar is going to be? I mean, this is a no-brainer. Tell me why you would not put a kid in this program. It's almost like these people are saying, they need to learn English. Okay, here's how they learn English. No, not like that. <laughs> right? If you want the English outcome, this is the obvious way to do it. Even children who have individualized educational plans, who have uh, learning challenges, who have Down syndrome, all different kinds of learning challenges, can and do do well in dual immersion programs. What percent of the planet is bilingual? Within that 60% are whatever the proportion is of human beings who have those kinds of challenges, okay? So there are all kinds of kids who can and do become bilingual. And if you don't want to believe Houston, you don't want to believe California, I'll tell you what, <laughs> anywhere you look, Stanford, North Carolina, El Paso, Portland, district after district after district are finding the same thing. Dual immersion is best for these kids. English acquisition and is best for their academic um, outcomes. Now, we can ask ourselves why, but I got to start wrapping up here. Um, part of the reason is that the kids don't fall behind. When you learn dos mas dos son cuatro, you don't have to relearn two plus two is four after you've learned it. You've already learned how to add, okay? Now, some kids do just fine. They don't fall behind, but so many children do because they just don't understand what was going on. So this is one reason. Another reason might be because of these general cognitive advantages to bilingualism that we cited earlier that we don't fully understand. Could that be part of the reason why these kids are doing better? And then this last reason I really like a lot, um, it's the fact that you're respecting that child's home language and bilingual identity. So let's think about Joaquin for a moment. Joaquin, when he shows up to an all English speaking school environment, even if those teachers are wonderful, and they usually are, and my colleagues who are in ESL, and my colleagues who are in transitional bilingual education, they agree with what I'm about to say. It's no, not full of evil teachers who are out to make these children feel bad, no. But the message still is, oh, Joaquin, if you didn't have that Spanish holding you back, English is what's important, you need to learn this, and then you can go and be in the mainstream with everybody else. Okay, that's kind of the message that's, that's there, okay? In cambio, when Joaquin is in a dual immersion program, 50 to 90% of the day, Joaquin is a rey. He's the kid who knows, right? The little gueritos are asking him for help. What did she say? I didn't understand anything, right? Okay? He can show, and I remember, if you ever get a chance to go to a kindergarten dual immersion classroom during week one, please go. It is, I was, um, right before COVID, I was in North Carolina, and I was in a dual immersion classroom week one, kindergarten. And I'll never forget, so they're sitting at carpet time, you know, they're on the alfombra in their little circle, and the teacher's got a basket full of shapes, and the children are supposed to walk up, pull out a shape, and say it's shape, and say it's color. And this little African-American girl walked up, and she pulled up a blue triangle. The teacher's talking Spanish the whole time. Ay, muy bien, fulanita, pues, ¿cómo se llama? ¿De qué, de qué forma tiene lo que tienes en la mano? And of course, she's just standing there like, mm. All those little Latino kids are losing their minds. Triangulo, triangulo, triangulo. So she goes, triangulo? And she goes, muy bien, muy bien, fulanita. Ahora dime de qué color es el triángulo. And she, right? And the kids, azul, azul, azul. They're just losing, right? And I'm thinking to myself, what would be the experience of these children down the street in that all English context, right? Where they don't get to show what they know, where they don't get to be excited, where their knowledge is not valued, okay? Now, you might be asking yourself, well, now, wait a minute, what about that poor African-American girl who stood there not knowing what was going on? Isn't that kind of bad for her? Aren't you doing to her what you say we shouldn't be doing to the Spanish-speaking kids? There's a big difference, isn't there? Is that girl in danger of losing her English? Is that girl going to have any issues in her life when she goes out and leaves that classroom, right? Isn't her language the one that's valued, right? Th th there's a big difference there. She is not positioned as a language minority, She's not right, so there's a lot of things that are regarding English. Um, so that's a big difference there. Anyway, I'm going to conclude by telling you about their Spanish, okay? Because as we mentioned earlier, more than half of the grandchildren of Spanish-speaking immigrants do not speak Spanish, and this is, um, I I'd like to sort of highlight this in response to the excellent talk we had last night by Tim where he talked about Spanish being maintained. It's being maintained because new folks are coming. It is not being maintained intergenerationally, okay? So I, I'm sorry to be glasses half empty, but it really is the case, okay? And we see it all the time. So I did a study up in Chicago with, a, with um, a grad student. Here's what we did. One school building, two tracks. 
all English track parents can choose or the dual language track which parents can choose, okay? Um, and the school is a typical public school, okay? It's uh, mostly Latino. 84% are receiving free or re reduced lunch, which indicates, right, low levels of income. So this is a working class neighborhood with a lot of Latinos in it, okay? All these kids that we tested speak Spanish at home. We went in there and we gave them a listening comprehension activity, something like, uh, eh, Juanita fue al parque y vio tres ardillas. ¿Cuántas ardillas vio Juanita? Something like that, right? And the kids have to answer. Well, as you can see, the blue bar is the kids who are in the English program. Their parents chose the English program. And they didn't do too badly on this because they hear Spanish at home all the time. But even still, the dual immersion kids did much better. Those who are hearing Spanish 50 to, well, in this case, 80% of the day uh, at school. Okay, so you can see there are some differences there. Reading is where we saw a much bigger difference. Because these kids, yeah, they're speaking Spanish at home. You know what they're not doing? They're not reading in Spanish at home, okay? It's, uh, there's data that suggests it's not very common for that. So look at these differences. They're much bigger. And when we compare the differences between the reading and the listening, you can see the much bigger difference. And the writing, y'all, the writing. Let me show you. These are kids, they speak Spanish at home, but every time they walk into that building and grab their little pencil, everything they do is in English, okay? And they were asked to describe this drawing here. This kid writes, ellos son comiendo eggs, él está haciendo eggs. That's not too bad, okay? The kid's six, you know? It's, that's fine. This child over here who says, yo hablo español, yo quiero jugar el juego, we called it a juego, right? We didn't say, we're doing a study of morphological development among children in two types of violent. We said, do you want to play? ¿Quieren jugar? ¿Quieren jugar en español? Sí! Um, and this is what the child wrote. Dad making eggs, the kid helped dad. Now, can I prove to you that this child was completely incapable of writing in Spanish? Like maybe if I picked him up upside down and shook him, maybe he could have done I don't know. But this is what he did. And you saw the averages. The averages suggest that these children are not writing as well in Spanish as their friends across the hall. Their friends across the hall, lo niño, it's not perfect, okay, remember, it doesn't have to be. Los niños está limpiando y la mamá es tomando chocolate y él, y se le fue la onda ahí al niño. Um, el papá está cocinando huevo ahí, dice, right? And look at this kid. Están cocinando huevos y tomando jugo y los huevos ya acabaron de cocinar. There's not enough lines to contain everything this child wants to say in Spanish and can write in Spanish, okay? Cocinándoles huevos. Oh, my gosh. So I'll show this to the parents. I'll say, okay, how do you want your kids to write? Right? Uh, fifth grade, the differences are, so now when you're in fifth grade, you've done preschool, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth. You're now in your seventh year of all English education. Okay? And it shows. Okay? They have difficulties producing any written Spanish. Okay? Here's their friends across the hall. I mean, we won't have time to analyze it right now, but that's what we're doing in our research, both the quantity and the quality, the lexical richness, the syntactic complexity, all of it. Okay? So this is what I show those parents. I say, you know, if you want your child to write like this, go ahead, put them in an English program. That's great. But if you want them to write like that, you're going to need to put them in that dual language program. And P.S., and I know this is what's most important to those parents, their English, at least in this study, was no different. No different. Now, you might be saying, well, wait a minute. You showed us in Houston and in California. That yellow bar was way the heck up there. I can't, I don't know why. This is what I found. So while I can't look those parents in the eye and say, your kid's English will be better, guess what? It's not any worse. I can look them in the eye and say, your children's English will not suffer, and they'll get all this rich Spanish. Okay? Um, and we, P.S., I want to point out, bilinguals do not have to pass for monolinguals, and language contact does result in changes to one or both of the languages. And I want to point this out to families because a lot of times a young speaker of a language other than English, I'll, I'll use Spanish, but you can substitute whatever language you're thinking about, okay? They get this double whammy, okay? Mainstream society, 80% monolingual in English tells them, ooh, no, don't speak that, we don't want that here, that doesn't belong here, you're not American, blah, 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 blah. But then guess what? Their own families tell them, oh, que terrible hablas, hablas como gringo, hablas pocho, you speak Spanglish, your language is terrible, mocked by their own family members. If I had that kind of pressure, you know what I'd probably do? I'd stop speaking it, okay? So if you are a family member you, working with a language other than English, please support those kids, right? Don't laugh at them, don't mock them, and keep in mind languages are changing, and language change is accelerated 
when languages are in contact. Yes, we can encourage the development of a more monolingual variety. We can do that through schooling and, and other means, but let's not discourage our young people from speaking. Okay, real quick, what about my guerito? How did he do? His English and all of the other children, their English was right on par. Plus, he got Spanish. Here's an example. Mi actividad favorita es ir al parque. This is fifth grade. A mí me gusta, this kid showed up with zero Spanish. Zero. Okay? A mí me gusta ir al parque porque puedo correr libre. En el parque me gusta, blah, 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 and there's not enough lines for her to write everything. And I love it. And how she talks about, si eres muy talentoso, puedes ir upside down. <laughs> upside down. So there are lots and lots of school districts where parents are lined up to get dual immersion. Uh, dual language in Texas, you may know, is pretty robust. You've got a fair number of programs here, and that's fantastic. I, I uh, went to the duallanguageschools.org, and this is what I found. Okay, um, Austin's doing quite well. Dallas is doing quite well. Um, so I would encourage you to, to, to check those out if you're thinking about that for your kids. Final word, and this is something that Naya already mentioned, there can be short periods of time. And I have to be completely honest with the parents so they don't freak out and pull their kids out of the program. Okay, Where some children have not yet acquired the same levels of English as their peers, but this is temporary. Okay, it's like the tortoise and the hare, right? Okay, who wins <laughs> in the end? Do not compare those children when they're in those early grades, okay? Your child is building a bicycle, and that's much more complex than the unicycle. You've got to give your child time to build that. So I always tell parents, it's like the three little pigs. You know the story, right? First little pig leaves home. What does he build his house out of? Straw. That's like the ESL programs. ESL programs make it look like your house went up real quick, but is it strong? Not really. Okay. Second little pig builds his house out of what? Sticks. Wood. Right? This is like those transitional bilingual, like that crutch program, right? Okay. Takes a little longer, but it is a little stronger. However, if you're a mom and you've got your kid in a bilingual program and you're talking to your comadre who's got her kid in the ESL program, you might say, oh my gosh, my child only has the foundation. My comadre's kid has the foundation and the walls. What have I done? I'm going to pull my kid out of there and put him in all. No, don't do that. Your child's building something that's much, much stronger, right? Now, what about that third little pig? Build the house out of what? This is dual language, y'all. This is the, but I understand a mom who's got her kid in here talking to her, you know, hairdresser whose kid has the, 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 the um, foundation, right? And the hairdresser's called Madre's kid has the foundation and the wall. And she says, oh my gosh, my kid is so far behind. What have I done? I should have never listened to that lady who came and told me to put him in dual language. I'm pulling him out right away. Please don't. You've got to wait. Porque cuando llegue el lobo, <laughs> right? And, and I don't know what the wolf might represent. Here's where my analogy goes off the rails. Maybe it's um, a low level of English or loss of ac uh, heritage language, perhaps academic failure, right? When all these things come, you want that stronger house to be. Study after study, show it, Okay. You've also heard of the seal of biliteracy, haven't you? Seal of biliteracy is something you get on your high school diploma that does not document that you're bilingual. It documents that you're what? Biliterate. That's why it's called the seal of biliteracy. Two young ladies show up to uh, apply for a job. They both say, yeah, I'm bilingual. One of them got the seal of biliteracy. Who might be more likely to get that job? Okay? And you can get that job. You can get the seal, excuse me, through a dual language program. It prepares you much better. Final word is about social justice. Um, and here I'm focusing on our Spanish speakers. We know that one out of every four, one out of every four kids in this country is Latino, okay? 30% live in poverty. About 30% begin school as English learners, um, et cetera, et cetera. One out of every four having the undocumented parent and that, that terror coming home from school and their parent was deported, okay? I, I'm not suggesting that dual language solves all these problems. What I am suggesting is that dual language is the best we have to offer, and these kids need it, and these kids deserve it. And we should absolutely, every, there's no reason why every kid should not be in a program like this. I think it could improve the loss of languages within families. I think it could improve this problem here, right, with folks not learning English as well. And what about these folks? We didn't talk about all of them. We talked about some of these folks. What if this fella had gone to school in a dual language program? alongside a kid like Joaquin. I, I like to think he wouldn't grow up to be such a, you know, I like to think it inoculates people <laughs> against being like that and maybe just not tolerating. Nobody wants to be tolerated. We want to be appreciated. Appreciating, 
linguistic diversity. And since everybody loves uh, looking at little kids, I thought I'd play you this, this video. And what this video does is it challenges the idea of what it means to be, they use the word American, I prefer the word United Statesian, but we'll go ahead and, and work with their word, which is American, and uh, tell me what you think about this video. I think it's awful cute. I am American. Yo en inglés y español. I am American. Je parle français, anglais y español. I am American. 我讲中文和英文。我 I'm American. En inglés también están I'm American. In a Inglesinha, in a Amarinha, in a Grado. I am American. Mi hindi ay mi botalu. I am American. Man in Ulisi va for si half mizanam. I am American. Ya kamaru paniski i paruskim. I am American. Hunta para chio di English. I am American. For best. Inglesa, Portuguesa, Chirumanesta. I'm American. Anything English in my own Samsari campus. I'm an American. Me Angredi or Ordu Voltigo, I am American. Tanen Yogoa, Hagumal Hamda. I am American. Yes, Hosmem Hayelen, Yavangren, and I am American. 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 I'm American! And I'm back in Lido Arabic when and I and I'm American. <laughs> So the idea here being that we can encourage and should encourage strong bilingual development and the way to do that is through dual immersion education and encouraging our families to keep up their languages in the home. So here is where I will stop. Thank you very much. Thank you for that presentation. If you all have any questions, feel free to come up to the microphone at this time. We still have a few minutes left. Unless you want to shout it, I'll probably hear you. I saw one hand back there. Hi. So I was wondering if you ever looked at schools doing true immersion in languages like French or Greek or you know any sort of non-Spanish languages. Because I know around here, there's a lot of Spanish immersion, which is really important. Um, but I just wondered if you have ever done studies looking at any other true immersion programs in other languages. If I could clone myself and have those clones speak those languages, that's where I would send them. <laughs> I would totally send them to do that. Um, the last time I looked, 93% of the dual language schools in this country were operating in Spanish for you know, reasons that you cited, they're obvious. Um, but there are schools in, oh my gosh, th they do exist in French, Navajo, Japanese, Italian, Polish, Japanese, Korean. Um, you can find them in all kinds of, of languages. I visited, la I'm originally from New York, um, Long Island, and I got to go back and look at the French Heritage Language Program, which operates, it's very robust in the New York City area. And I'm pretty sure we were in the Bronx. They took me to this after-school French Heritage uh, Program and there were these students from Burkina Faso, and they did a play in French, and it just gave me, it was, it was wonderful. So yes, they're out there. Um, if, if you Google them up or if you want to email me, I can try to connect you with, with um, some of those programs. But I, I, don't, I don't know exactly what research has been done in them on the children's language development. I think, you know, things just sort of take time, and we don't have a lot of resources, unfortunately. So the first thing is to, like, get the programs there, and then now we'll look more with fine-grained detail how they're working and how we can make them better and how we can ensure that they are serving also the needs of language minority children, uh, at least in Spanish, that's who they were founded for, 
and not becoming what some researchers are calling gentrified, right? And not um, privileging sort of the white upper class families, right? They need to, they need to maintain a social justice mission as well. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts? Thank you for that wonderful talk. And uh, I think here in Texas, as you mentioned, we have a lot of immersion programs uh, or people who are interested in that. Uh, but as you mentioned, lack of resources is a problem and finding teachers who are not only bilingual, but biliterate and certified to teach those programs. Um, do you have, I don't know, thoughts on that or what we logistically can do to help support these types of programs? Yes, you're absolutely right. Teacher education is probably the number one thing we need. If you think about what a third grade dual immersion teacher is doing, right? Um, some of them are bilingual and they teach in the morning in Spanish and the afternoon in English. Others, they do have a separation, one teacher, one language. But they are teaching content, I don't know, volcanoes, whatever it is, to two groups of children, half of whom are, for whom the language is a first language, the other half for whom the language is not the first language, and they're trying to do this all, I mean, they're, they're magicians. They're, they're the most talented people on the planet, and they're underpaid. Can we talk? Okay, teaching in this country, you know, very, very undervalued. And there are not enough programs out there to train them how to do this magical thing um, well. Um, in Illinois, you can count on one hand and have four fingers left over. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. how many programs there are that um, professionally prepare dual language teachers. That's Roosevelt University in Chicago. Um, so yeah, that's one of the biggest, what would be a good solution for that? Oh, I don't know. I, I, it would be nice if at the federal level we had a uh, bi multilingualism cabinet guru person, right? If the federal government decided, okay, we want no child left monolingual, we're going to appoint somebody and we're going to put money there, right? And then train these teachers. B while I am saying that money is needed and necessary, we have to put some, some investment there. I want to be really careful. These programs don't necessarily cost more money. Some people shy away because they think it costs more money. It really doesn't. Same number of teachers. You're not buying two, two sets of textbooks. You don't have to buy two sets of social studies textbooks, one in English and one in Chinese. You, you, you can divide your subjects up so that you're only buying one set of textbooks. So it does not necessarily have to cost more money. But we definitely need more investment of resources for sure. Yes? Yes, and resources are key, but also uh, <laughs> institutions that focus on it. UTSA had the first master's in bilingual education, and as far as I know, still has the only PhD in bilingual bicultural education right down the road at UTSA. A separate comment about how we think about things intellectually, and those of you who've researched the area, uh, anytime we look, think about code switching, what we're seeing is the individual having the two different ways for the same concept. Sombrero and hat, right. but it's the same concept. And I'm wondering, does our brain work like written Mandarin? Because once you read and write Chinese, it doesn't matter what language you speak because it's not phonetic, it's conceptual. And so I wonder if our brain really functions, which makes it easier once we start being bilingual to be trilingual and quadrilingual uh, those of you who do the research can comment more, but I'm surprised we haven't at least referred to the fact that, uh, at, especially in Chinese, it's automatically a code-switching way of writing. Right, that's My a really good point because of the different scripts, yeah. Um, so at dinner last night, I know that Naya talked um, a little bit with us about, was it you, Naya, that was mentioned? Somebody was mentioning um, that when you've learned... We all sort of know this intuitively, but, but the science actually shows that when you've learned uh, a language young, it does sort of, I'll use the word prime, it primes you so that your critical period, your, your acquisition of other languages is facilitated. I'll just use, I think that's a safe way to say it. Um, but here's something else that Arturo Hernandez said to us when he came to talk. He's a neurolinguist. He said, here's what we know about the brain. Take a microphone and suspend it a mile above Beijing. What can you hear through that microphone? He's like, that's kind of what we know. <laughs> we can hear a fire over here or something really loud over there. That, that's that we, our, our understanding of the brain is super limited at this time. So we don't have answers to interesting questions like yours. Although I will, you did remind me of a study um, that was done in New York City talking about how 
you know, hat and sombrero might mean the same thing, might not mean the same thing to a speaker. This study, here's what they did. They took folks who had arrived from Latin America as adults. So their Spanish acquisition you could call complete. They were monolingual in Spanish. Okay? Then they, ra they had their children raise them in New York City. Okay? They were interviewed twice in Spanish about the same topics. Okay? Uh, one was again, in Spanish, tell me about your life in Latin America, and when they used, when they did this in Spanish, thinking back to their own life in Latin America, they would use certain words, edificio, el director de la escuela, el, you know, right, certain terms. Then they were asked, again, this is all taking place in Spanish, tell me about raising your kids here in New York. And guess what? These same individuals who just 10 minutes ago had said el edificio would say el building who 10 minutes ago had said el director de la escuela would say el principal de la escuela, who 10 minutes ago would say y durante Pascua would now say y durante Easter. Now, you can't say that it's because they didn't know the word in Spanish. They had just said the word in Spanish. Okay? And what these researchers postulate, this was by um, Ricardo Tegui and, 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 and Ophelia Garcia, some concepts simply don't mean the same thing. So edificio and building are not the same thing. It's not the same in your head. The edificio is a nice, clean, respectable place. Un building is a tenement hall with rats and roaches and stuff, right? It's not the same thing, okay? Um, el principal is a principal uh, here in the United States. In Latin America, el director de escuela frequently teaches also, right? Whereas the principal here does not. So a principal is not the same thing as a director. So in, f not all words are like this, not all uh, neologisms, new terms. True, very true. Indeed, indeed. Pues creo que ya rugen las panzas, ¿verdad? I'm starting to, people are starting to get hungry. It's probably lunchtime, so thank you again for your attention.